to bear Gospel of Deliverance. I'm Pastor Steve Williams. Thank you for joining me today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. That is all important to us, to feel you, Lord God, to sense you in your word and in our hearts today, to know that you are near. We praise you for this and so much more because you alone are worthy of our praise and our thanksgiving. God, we ask that you anoint our minds and our hearts that we may truly receive what you have for us today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone or every person is a farmer. Everyone is a farmer. Now, I don't intend to imply that all people plow the ground and plant seeds and tend to a harvest of corn, wheat, rice, or any number of vegetables, but instead the sowing and reaping of righteousness and unrighteousness is our subject. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 through 9 will be our primary text. Galatians Chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Praise God for those beautiful words. Words of encouragement, instruction, and admonition that we should keep our eyes upon Christ alone. John Gill said, As to kind, quality, and quantity, generally speaking, if he sows wheat, he reaps wheat. If he sows barley, he reaps barley. No man can expect to reap another sort than what he sows. And if it is good seed, he may hope for a good crop. And if he sows bountifully, he shall reap bountifully. But if he sows sparingly, he shall reap sparingly. And if he sows nothing, he can never reap anything. This is a proverbial expression and may be applied to all actions, good and bad, and the reward and punishment of them. Oh, how true. We, I think, forget sometimes as believers that God has not changed and that we still sow and we still reap and that we are either reaping for bad things or good things. Christian friend, we need to make sure that we are planting good, that we know what we're planting, that we are fully aware of everything. No differently that if you went out to your garden and you were planting seeds for flowers or you were planting seeds for vegetables, you need to know what you're planting. Otherwise, you will be completely surprised 
And in the spiritual realm, that is not a good thing to not know what you're planting. To go through life unawares that you are being sharp, you're being hateful, you are being in discord with those around you, and you don't even realize what you're planting, your harvest will be of the same. Let's go to Romans chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 6 through 11. Romans 2 and 6 through 11, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God, Hallelujah. There is no respect of persons with God. He doesn't care where you came from. He doesn't care what your past was. He doesn't care whether you're a man or a woman. It's about planting. It's about reaping. The preacher's homiletical commentary said, Account will be taken of the aim which has governed the moral action. An account. God is constantly, like a great accountant, is taking note of everything we do. Nothing is left off the books. Oh, how we wish it were so, but it is not. We must take account in our lives that God marks everything we plant, and we reap it. We need to be careful what we sow. That we need to be sowing in righteousness and not in unrighteousness. In softness and gentleness and not in harshness and unkindness. F.B. Meyer wrote, The rewards of the future and the enjoyment of what God means by life are conditioned upon our obedience. Glory, honor, and peace are within your reach if you will accept the reconciliation offered you in Christ, which will bring you into atonement, or as Meyer broke it down, at one with God. And if you will live to do your heavenly Father's will. Friend, we need to be about at one atonement with God, coming close to Him, and not backing down one whit, but staying in His will. That's what we have to have. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. Every man will be rewarded according to his works. B.W. Johnson said, uh, Then all shall receive their deserts. Those who lose their lives shall gain life. Those who choose the world shall lose all. If we want to gain with God, we've got to lose everything. Everything must be put at risk in this life our houses, our monies, our transportation, our security, must be put at risk for the sake of God's kingdom. We cannot care about what is going on in this world. And you're saying, well, Pastor Steve, this sounds opposite of a lot of the financial teaching we are hearing. If you're hearing that you need to lay up treasures on this earth, and that your mind is uh, bifurcated 
to two things, securing your worldly future and securing your heavenly future, you're being directed wrongly. I said you're being directed wrongly. But the Bible does not teach us to strongly attack about finances. I said the Bible does not strongly teach about getting riches. There are wise things to do, but we must be about our Father's business. We must be about eternal life. That's what we're called to. Revelation 22 and 12. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Exactly as it has been. Friend, let us stay ever compliant with Christ and always submissive to His will and especially keeping ourselves humble and repentant at all times, in all places, because we do not want to find ourselves unawares of what we have planted. Joseph Benton wrote to judge the world and my reward, both of grace and vengeance, is with me. The reward which I shall assign both to the righteous and the wicked shall be conferred at my coming to give to every man according as his work, his spirit and conduct, his whole inward and outward behavior shall be. Mm. See, I think in the modern church, much of the teaching of rewards and punishments have been laid aside, somehow thinking that just because we have prayed a prayer, that we are on the right road, that there is no planting and reaping. But there is. There always has been. It has never changed. Instead, what we plant, we reap. Let us be careful what we plant. Let us not shrug it off and say, well, surely it's not that important. Friend, it is of vital importance. Friend, it may be eternally important what we plant. Let us be careful. Our next several verses are examples of that reaping and sowing. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, again that's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. John Wesley wrote, God will proportion the reward to the work and the temper whence it proceeds. Oh, hallelujah. Wonderful insight that we need to be careful not only in what we plant, but how we plant it. What is our temperament when we proceed with that planting? Robert Hawker said, He who is able to make all grace abound hath engaged in covenant faithfulness to do so. My God, saith Paul, shall supply all your need, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Reader, pause. Over this sweet account, let a child of God, conscious of his adoption character, feel his wants ever so great or many. Let his exercises be what they may, temptations from without, fears within, and everything around dark and discouraging. This one assurance removes all, if a covenant God can supply to all our need, and make all grace abound. What shall arise to counteract such a resource? His grace must exceed all our wants, and His ability infinitely outstretch all our necessities, so that here is enough to rest upon, and to rely in for every emergency 
Oh, for grace then from the God of all grace to believe and trust God for every occasion. Our need affords occasion for His supply and His power and disposition to help outruns and exceeds all our wants. What a multitude of promises we have to this one point. Now, let me say a few words upon what uh, Brother Hawker said regarding this verse in 2 Corinthians. Why would a believer take into their own hands to attempt to make reward rather than accept reward? These are contrary one to the other. We cannot seek our own compensation in this life and expect a bountiful eternal harvest. We must be more than satisfied with the prizes from God's own hands. I'll be right back with more of our text, Every Person is a Farmer, after this original song by David Cornell. i 
mind says Detour ahead It's more like my life than you'll ever know Bumpy roads and delays But I know I'll get there just the same Cause I know I'm gonna move on I'm gonna move Moving on Ain't looking back Look to the future, that's where it's at The past is the past We're going to be next reading in Luke chapter 16, verse 25. Luke 16 and 25, and the Bible says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Once we're there, that's our reward. That's the eternal reward that we can look toward when what we have planted is reaping for here. What we are planting, if it is to be reaped here, we will reap eternal death. If, on the other hand, what we are planting is for eternity, is for eternal life, we may lose out on many things here, but we will reap marvelous, bountiful harvest for all eternity future. Matthew Henry said, Our Savior came to bring us acquainted with another world and to show us the reference which this world has to that, and here is, does it, in this description we may observe the different condition of a wicked rich man and a godly poor man in this world. We know that as some of late, so the Jews of old, were ready to make prosperity one of the marks of a true church, of a good man, and of a favorite of heaven, so that they could hardly have any favorable thoughts of a poor man. This mistake Christ upon all occasions set himself to correct. Friend, we need to make sure that the church we're in is not about riches and wealth. That the clothes you wear determine how good of a Christian you are. Well, if they were really prosperous in the Lord, they'd have nice clothes. They'd have that $1,000 suit. 
they'd have that 300,000 or that 500,000 or that million dollar home or that two million dollar home. Friend, that's not what gets it done in heaven. That big bank account, all of that retirement where you've got a couple of million dollars laid up for your elder years and to pass on to your children, that's not what you're going to get in heaven. Instead, what you're going to get in heaven is what you plant in the Spirit, through the Spirit, by the Spirit of Christ Jesus. Let's read in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness up on you. Glory to God, friend. We need to make sure that we are sowing in righteousness and not worldliness. That we're not caught up in making ourselves better in this world. Trying to get ahead in our arguments with people trying to get ahead by stepping on the person just ahead of us, making sure that we take the lead. No, that's not the way to get ahead in heaven. That's the way to get ahead in hell. If you want to get ahead in heaven, if you want blessing eternal, then you've got to plant in the Spirit the things of God that he has said. Joseph Exel wrote, there is not a more melancholy delusion than this, that in religious life the grand object may be secured without the use of the appointed means, that men may possess Christian privileges and realize Christian rewards independently of those holy and strenuous endeavors so plainly required by our divine Lord. In spiritual things, there cannot be a canceling of the rule which obtains in temporal things. The most unfading of crowns cannot be worn where there has been no running in the race. The most splendid of victories cannot be achieved where there has been no entrance into the battle. The most peaceful of havens cannot be reached where there has been no contending with the winds and the waves. The most glorious of harvest cannot be gathered in where there has been no laboring in the field. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, I want us to think about this for just a moment. We have got to get ourselves straight in our thinking. Make sure that we know what we're planting. That we know that we are laboring for something beyond a house beyond our transportation, beyond the clothes on our back, beyond how our kids look and what items they have and what electronics they can lay hold of, what music we like, what entertainments we like, all of that, my friends, needs to take not only a back seat, but we need to pretend that we're in one of those long stretch limousines and all of that all of that junk from the world all of that stuff that is part of this carnal life needs to be about 17 and a half seats behind us way behind and the glory of God and his planting and his reaping need to be in the driver's seat Hosea chapter 8 verse 7. Hosea chapter 8 and we will be in verse 7. For they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. It's plain. Plain as the nose on your face if you have one. It's so plain that we need to sow 
not wind, things that are blown away, things that are taken away, but instead we need to be planting in the good ground that Christ has given to us. We need to be planting in the good ground that has been prepared, and we need to be planting of spiritual things. Otherwise, we will find ourselves losing out at the harvest time. The Cambridge Bible Notes had this to say, the consequences of Israel's evil conduct and policy are here represented under the figure of sowing and reaping. But the form of the figure is varied. First, Israel sows wind and reaps whirlwind, i.e., his present conduct is unprofitable to himself and the requital of it shall be actual destruction. Next, though Israel sows a corn plant, it never grows up to its full size. It, i.e., Israel, hath no standing corn. Or if it does, it either yields the farmer no meal, or its meal is seized upon by the enemy, i.e., the worldly results of Israel's policy are never good, and any wealth that it attains passes into the hands of the enemy. Friends, if we have worldly policies in our lives, just as in this scripture in Hosea tells us, if we have worldly counsel, if we have worldly policies that we are living by and gaining by, it's not going to bring harvest spiritually for us. It cannot. It will not. What we thought we had will soon be taken by the enemy. If not taken by the enemy here, it will definitely be taken by the ultimate enemy of all man, Satan. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Before we finish our message today, Reverend Rick Cornell has a few encouraging words for us. to share with you an article written by a world missionary director. His name is Charles R. Mosier. I hope you will enjoy it. It's entitled, Is It Worth It? Everyone has probably had this thought enter their mind at some time in their life in regard to their job, a trip, or their ministry. Is it worth it? It has entered my mind, and I'm sure that at some time or other, our missionaries have had to deal with it as well. Is it worth it? The long hours of toil, the difficulties encountered in travel, the separation from family, and at times, even danger to your life. Is it worth it? Sometimes you don't you just ask yourself that question, is it worth it? I will answer that question in the way it was answered for me. After much hassle in securing my visa on January the 9th, 1995, I flew to Brazil to attend and participate in their national convention. When I walked into the gymnasium for the first service, the stand and floor of the gym was full of people giving worship and praise to Jesus. Beautiful people praising God with the glow of the Holy Spirit on their faces. While I watched them worship, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Yes, it is worth it. Every mile down terrible roads, every trip on the Amazon, every bout with malaria, every drop of sweat, every prayer prayed and every dollar given, it is worth it. Fellow missionary, pastor, minister, lay member, always remember that whatever we do for Jesus at whatever the price, it will always be worth it. 
So we must never, never, never quit until the king says, it's enough. Come up higher. Well, I hope you enjoy those words by Charles Mosier. And uh, I think it's something we can stand to learn by, don't you? I believe it is worth it. Our final verse for our study is Proverbs chapter 11, verse 18. Proverbs 11 and 18. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. A sure reward. W. Bonner Hopkins, an Anglican vicar at Littleport in the suburb of Eli in the United Kingdom, uh, which is just north of Cambridge. He pastored there during the mid to late 1800s. He said of this verse, here is intentionally set before us a good specimen of a bad man. He is a man who works and works hard in his own way. Some evildoers are idle, profligate, sensual, devilish, such seldom deceive themselves, and but rarely deceive others. But here is described a man who is very likely to deceive both himself and others. Wicked men are often shrewd men of the world, and clever. They are zealous and laborious men, though the objects they aim at may be unworthy and bad. Their mistake is not in the way they work, but in the thing they work for. If all Christians were as eager in their pursuit of truth and charity, and all good works as worldly men are in their search after riches and pleasures, what a difference it would make. Whilst the wicked man works in earnest fashion for time, does he attempt any like efforts for eternity? It is a mistake to think the bad man does not care for eternity at all. Multitudes attempt to serve two masters, a man who works with all his strength for worldly success often persuades himself that he will be able to work for eternity too. Does he then labor for the meat that endureth unto eternal life? Nay, at this point his wisdom is at fault. The deceitfulness of his work begins to appear. He is no better than a spiritual impostor and spendthrift. He knows nothing of the faith which awakens the generous and noble impulses of humanity, which touches the heart and makes the life holy. He is altogether ignorant of the quickening and sanctifying grace of the Holy Ghost. Not such is the work of the righteous. He soweth righteousness. The sowing of the seed is the crowning act of the husbandman's preparation for a crop. All his other work goes for nothing unless it be consummated by this work. The wicked is said to work, but the just sows righteousness. The text describes a work of faith. He who sows righteousness does it in order that he may hereafter gather in the harvest. What is the seed he sows? To sow righteousness, to sow in righteousness, and to sow to the Spirit all means the same thing. It is to live righteously, to do righteous actions, to perform acts of devotion and piety to God, and to do works of truth and justice and charity towards our neighbors. It is to learn to do the will of God looking forward to a future harvest having respect unto the recompense of the reward. My brothers, my dear sisters in Christ Jesus, we need to make sure what we are building our future for. What are we sowing for? What are we planting? What is the purpose? What are our policies? 
with regards to what we plant. Are we seeking things for right now? Or do we have our minds upon eternity? Have lately our minds been upon leaving and going home to be with Christ Jesus? Let us be about that thought. That train of thought is good. Let us seek the planting that will reap in that harvest. Let us not spend our time worried about this future, but instead let us be concerned about all eternity future. Let us not be concerned about keeping up with the Joneses. Let us not be concerned about taking care of the upcoming apocalypse. Everyone is concerned. My goodness, so many are worried about the, well, they're worried about the lights going out, and they're worried about the viruses, and they're concerned about the governments and how they're going to treat us. Everybody's worried about everything. They've stockpiled their ammunition. They've got all of their guns. They've got all of their foods. They've got all of their clothes extra. They've got all of the means of which they can take care of themselves. Let us be careful, for that is our preparation. We may say, yes, but it's to have wisdom and use wisdom. Yes, but let us not use the scriptural direction to use wisdom in our life to reveal something else. Let us instead let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us in our planting that we will plant what is correct, that we will not look for a current reward here, the preparation, the policies of ourselves. Be careful, prepper, that your prepping is all about your provision. Instead, make sure that you're really making the ultimate preparation. I preached that sermon last year, the ultimate prepper. The real ultimate prepper is not prepping for wars and rumors of wars, electricity outages, lack of food in the stores, sicknesses ravaging our globe, governments becoming tyrannical. That's not what the Bible is instructing us to prepare for. It's instructing us to prepare for all eternity future. And little of what else is going on on this earth will mean anything, anything to eternity future with Christ Jesus. So let's prepare, let's plant for what really means something. Our future with Jesus Christ, our Messiah, who laid it all on the line for us, and he didn't do it for us to be rich. He didn't do it that we might be prepared for a big war or for a tyrannical governance by those we elected. But instead, friend, he told us to prepare for his eternal home. But he's prepared for you and me. Let us be about that business of preparation. How about it? Let's do it for Jesus. Let's do it for our loved ones. Let's teach our children the true, good priorities of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, put our hearts back into the position of thinking upon you, of working for you, planting for you. Lord God, that we are not here to prepare ourselves for devastations and for um, tyrants and for diseases that are coming. That's all in your hands. Instead, let us prepare for eternity. For the first cannot damage us eternal. It can only harm here. But if we are prepared fully through the Spirit and by the Spirit, then we are prepared eternally 
completely, and our harvest will be great. Our harvest will be marvelous. It will be glorious because of you. But if we spend our time preparing for what is happening here, and our attention is upon it, Lord God, then how can we reap that in heaven? We can't. Teach us to desire to reap in your glorious kingdom to come, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you once again for joining me today. I pray that you have a great day in Christ Jesus. Goodbye. God bless. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine.